This is a Hot Pie Media Original. You have to fall in love with the journey. Wellness, fitness, health, it's a lifelong journey. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, you take your mind off of outcomes such as, well, I got to lose weight or I have to do this, or blah, blah, blah. I got to be ready for, to get in this dress for the wedding or whatever. You, you move away from that and you, and you teach yourself how to fall in love with the process. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7, and this is The Blueprint. I've spent my life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL, and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that experience and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their family, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Dr. Americus Reed II is a brand identity theorist and serves as a professor in the marketing department at Wharton. In this episode, Americus explains how we can use brand concepts to build an enduring identity around health and wellness, and how to consistently take action as you pursue your wellness goals. This was a really fun conversation about health and wellness with somebody that's coming from a completely opposite end of the spectrum, but after listening and internalizing these things, I think they're going to be invaluable for you as you pursue a lifetime of health and well-being. But now, would you please take one second and hit the subscribe button on whichever listening platform you're joining us from, as this is one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. But before we get to my discussion with Americus, imagine a team of world-class coaches and scientists focused only on you and your wellness goals. What would that feel like? These experts know exactly what you need today because they are precisely in tune with your mind and body. That kind of guidance is now available for everyone. AIM7 is a wellness app that provides custom exercise recommendations to improve the outcomes of programs and workouts you already love. It unlocks existing data from wearables and other apps to provide empathetic and scientific guidance that's perfectly in tune with your mind and body. Your team of world-class experts is ready to get started. To get early and free access to this exclusive program, go to www.aim7.com. That's AIM7.com and sign up now. There are limited spots available each month, so sign up now and reserve your spot. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Americus, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Eric. Very excited for our conversation. Me too. Um, what does an identity theorist do? Like, what is, what is that? I mean, it's a pretty cool thing. I was looking at yeah. your website, looking at Wharton. Like, totally. What is an identity theorist? Well, an identity theorist, Eric, is a, that first of all, that's a term that I made up. So, uh, you know, oh, that's I'm a, cool. I'm a, yeah, I'm a marketer. I'm a brander. So I had to come up with something to sort of label myself. Uh, but in all seriousness, an identity theorist is someone who's interested in understanding how a person or a consumer uh, considers and figures out who they are. And so what does this process of self-awareness look like where you decide the type of person that you want to be? And then how do you go about creating that identity? In other words, what sorts of behaviors will you engage in? What kinds of products will you consume? The entire gestalt of portfolio of decisions that make up this sense of who you are, who you want to be. An identity theorist wants to understand and unpack that at an excruciatingly painful level of detail. <laughs> so that's okay, my job. So how does somebody come to a point where like, this is who I am? This is my yeah. identity. Yeah, it's a great question, Eric. I think that I love that question because for me, it's the ongoing journey of life. And, you know, I, I can remember from early on, you know, this question of who am I and, and, and what, what is it that I'm doing here and why am I doing it? And so it's a fundamental psychological question that begins at an early age, almost to the extent that as soon as we're able to construct a kind of cognitive assessment of our place in the world relative to others and other institutions, we start asking this question. And so it's an ongoing question that we try to understand, that we try to answer. 
And that's where products can come in because products mm -hmm. can actually help us understand who we are and who we want to be. And we actually might choose certain products or brands because we think that is a way to become something that is the blueprint for our, our, our basically our individual identities. That's really interesting because I think about my childhood and, you know, iconic brands, Nike, yeah. Um, before mm -hmm. the Jordan brand existed, just the Jordan logo. Yeah. And watching Michael Jordan play basketball and seeing that logo, I felt like I could do something that was yes. beyond myself, even though there was no way I was going to be yeah. Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. It was inspirational, I had the posters, you know. Is that the type of thing you're talking about? That's that, Eric, is 100% of what I'm talking about. I'm going back yeah. to your point. I love this. The jump man, you know, it's got to be the shoes. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. You know, it's Spike a, Lee. It's, it's, that's exactly right. And it's like Spike Lee's premise was, you know, we're not going to ever be at that level of uh -huh. Michael Jordan, you know, arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest uh, NBA basketball player of all time. But what we can do is we can be, your, your word was absolutely correct. We can be inspired. We can be aspirationally uh, connected with whatever we think. Now, this is important. Whatever we believe the Michael Jordan brand and identity is. So it might be, for example, hard work, never giving up. It, we, we have in our mind these values that represent the Jordan brand. And us wanting to connect with the Jordan brand is essentially us taking on those values and getting a little piece of that vicarious energy uh, mm. through the Michael Jordan brand. And that's what, that's what identity is all about, really. So you're helping the companies create these identities and these values that people will then want to take on themselves or be attracted to. And the, when you talk, is, am I correct about that? Yeah, hundred percent correct. The companies okay. are trying to figure out how to get deep customer engagement, Eric. And mm -hmm. one way to do that is to make a connection with the consumer's sense of, just like you said, aspirational identity. Gotcha. It, when you talk about it this way, consumerism doesn't sound like such a bad thing. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? hundred percent, hundred percent. Because it's that, like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's like a company has an opportunity to help you shape yourself in a very positive direction if they choose to do that. That's a hundred percent correct. I've been making this argument for a long time, Eric. Uh, I've tried to make this argument in my TEDx talk for the talk I did at Penn. Basically like marketing and branding is not an evil thing inherently. Uh, mm -hmm. Connecting with a, a, a product, a service, an organization is not a bad thing inherently. I know there's this thing called materialism and consumerism and chasing stuff. I get that. But what I'm saying is that your point is 100% correct, Eric. There's an opportunity for a positive vibe, a positive energy, a positive aspirational connection to occur between people and brands, consumers and brands. And that's what I'm really focused in on. How can a brand, product, service, organization, et cetera, make your life better, make you thrive as a human being? That's the question I'm trying to answer. I love this. Um, and I'm going to get a link to your TED Talk and put it in the show notes here so people can go to that. Something you and I have talked off, talked about offline is this idea of how we can build an identity around wellness, around yes, our health. Yes, yes. How can we do that? I love this question, Eric. This is a fundamental question. We have to answer this question, and here's why. The research on this is very clear. Uh, there's a reason why the fitness industry, the wellness, health and fitness industry is a billion-dollar industry. Uh, there's a reason why when the new year rolls around, like it is right now, the gyms are jam-packed. Right. So everyone has a resolution. Everyone's trying to, OK, it's time to get started. It's the new year and so on. And what it is, is it's pointing to is the idea that what we have to do and the research is very clear on this. We have to develop a sense of identity around health and wellness. In other words, we have to figure out ways that we can connect with wellness and health related activities so that they reinforce a desire to self-express something that's internal about us. When you make that connection, when exercise, wellness, meditation, all of these, you know, this entire multitude of 
tools and behaviors, once that becomes internalized as part of who you are, then it's not something that's outside of you that's a task you have to get done. It's just, I wake up every day and I do this because this is just who I am. And so getting to that, creating that habit, that routine, and and really not trying to view it as this thing I have to do, but this thing I get to do. And sort of turning it into this internalized aspect of self-expression is really, the research is saying, the only way that an exercise of wellness, a health and and, and, uh, a program can be adhered to over time. Because when it's part of who you are, Eric, Mm -hmm. then as as soon as life gets hard, you know, you're still with it. If it's not part of who you are, as soon as life gets hard, you you just drop it because it's just another external thing that you have to get done that's way down on your priority list. So your point's 100%, Eric, which is to say, what are the things that we can do to take these behaviors and these exercise wellness uh, points of view and things that we can do, tools, behaviors, actions, Mm -hmm. and make them part of who we are? That's the big question. And so- uh, that's what I'm trying to help people uh, more generally answer. And this is where your work comes in as well, which is to be able to try to teach people how to move the thing from outside to the uh-huh. inside. That's where it's all critical. So do you have any suggestions or maybe one or two suggestions of where somebody could start? Yeah, that maybe be doesn't maybe this is like something that they want to foster in their life, but they're yes. not quite there yet. Yeah, I love that question, Eric. Uh, here's my advice on that. And I think it's, it's, it's starting small, right? So the reason why exercise is hard and it's an external sort of perceived thing is because you have in your mind this goal of like, man, I'd like to be fit. Man, I would really like to have all of these things. I'd like to be a certain weight. And it's just, it's too amorphous. So what you have to do is you have to kind of break it down into little actions, right? And for me, for example, the very first action that is my like sort of every single day, Eric, my little victory is when I get up and I put my feet on the floor and I put the shoes on. I, I've already, that's like, that's the first goal. Just put on the, the shoes, if you will, and start something really simple and easy. And so that's what, it, and then, and then, you know, you put your clothes on, you get ready. Uh, you know, maybe this involves a pre-workout, you know, whatever, whatever that is that so you do you work out it. first thing in the morning. I do. Absolutely. Okay. I work. Yeah, I work. I love working out. I actually work out at four o'clock in the morning because oh, God. Yeah. I, I love Mark the, Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the, the 3 a.m. club as it were. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm just, a, I'm a big believer. I, I, there's something about being awake when you think no one else is awake that, that kind of reinforces my own identity area. Cause like no one is willing to do this. So uh-huh. it, it's, it's almost a signal. Well, not no one, but very few people yeah. are willing to do this. So it's a signal of my own commitment. If I'm willing to get up at 4 a.m. But even so it's like that snooze button is calling your name. So how do, how do you get over that? To your point, Eric, Take your shoes, put them on. Okay, small Mm -hmm. victory. Put the clothes on. Okay, get your cup of coffee. Okay, get ready to go do this thing. And the thing that you go to do, Eric, you have to do the things that, here's very simple, but it makes obvious sense when you hear it. You do the things that give you joy, right? This is not complicated, right? This is not, if if you want to get fit and and have a good, healthy, robust life, then you got to move your body. Now, how you move it is infinitely uh, open to you and whatever you want to do. You want to do jumping jacks. You want to do CrossFit. You want to dance. That's great. You want to do rowing. You want to ride a bike. You want to go to the gym and be a gym rat and, and move the weights. Whatever that is, it has to be something that you enjoy. And so mm-hmm. you pick you pick this activity that you enjoy because the joy is the initial emotional impetus to create the habit and the routine that's the little that's the little nudge that gives you that little victory that gets you going on the trajectory so i've heard it said that that um emotions create habits yeah and i don't think in the long run i think the creation of the habit you want to have a positive emotional experience for that reward yes. prediction error yes um so what if somebody's like trying to create this, like, you know, BJ Fogg, his work up at Stanford, I think is really interesting. He talks about this yep. idea of celebration of like, sometimes you have to like, just find a way to like, like, oh, okay, I don't exercise. I'm going to give this a try. 
and you give it a try and then you need to be like you know what i freaking did a great job and that was fun yes. and like you have to like connect to it in the long run though if you're always celebrating it can kind of lead to a decrease in dopamine it does yes, yes. so yes. something i've been thinking about a lot is just like s- switching from in the initial habit creation and emotional experience and then moving into the growth mindset. I love of, this. Yeah. Like I'm going to find joy in the process. Yes. Does that make sense? It makes a hundred percent sense. And in fact, it's brilliant that that analysis is absolutely brilliant, Eric, because what I think it, for me, a similar sort of thing. I love what you said, which is the idea of you have to fall in love with the journey, wellness, fitness, health. It's a lifelong journey. Mm. And so you, you, you take your mind off of outcomes such as, well, I got to lose weight or I have to do this, blah, blah, blah. I got to be ready for, to get in this dress for the wedding or whatever. You, mm-hmm. you move away from that and you, and you teach yourself how to fall in love with the process. And so mm. what, I, what I did was I started off with the emotional piece because you're 100% correct. And the, the research that you're pointing to points to this very clearly that you get that dopamine, you get that sort of immediate reinforcement that says, okay, this is good. I enjoyed that. Let me do it again tomorrow. But at a certain point, I think for me, what takes over is what I refer to as when the the discipline actually takes over. And that's, that's the journey where it says like, I may not feel like I want to do this today, but I'm going to, that's where discipline steps in and says, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And because I love the journey and I love the process, I'm going to do it like I love it, even though I may not be feeling it on that particular particular day. And what we find, what I find for me, you can tell me if your experience is the same, Eric, is that even on the worst day, the worst workout, though it just didn't happen, I couldn't get it fired, couldn't get firing on all, on all cylinders, I still feel better than, than, than I, had I not done it, right? It's kind of like the, the only bad workout is the workout you choose not to do. Uh, I 100% agree because there's yeah. days where I'm just like, that's why you said start small. The The workout or the effort doesn't always have to be this monumental experience. It's like whatever it takes you to get over the action line and then be like, you know what? Good job. And then there is this satisfaction in that I did. It's like work. Like some days, yeah, you just don't have your A game. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's life. Like I don't care what guru biohacker out there says you are not 100 every day that's just not impossible that's right some days you get three legitimate hours of excellent work in and you need to be like you know what great some days it's six some days it's six that's correct. so something we've talked about before is architecting this process of falling in love so what i like is you're crossing the chasm from an emotional experience to discipline yeah um is there any I mean, I don't even know. Is there a way to kind of make that easier? Is it just kind of at some point there's got to be a conscious decision? Like, I'm just going to love the process. Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting, right? Because it, it's the, the the thousand mile journey starts with one step. And, uh, you know, I falter all the time, man. It's like, you know, but because it's a journey, because it's a process, I don't get bent out of shape if I fall prey to, you know, the Reese's Cups. Because it's just like, hey, man, I just I just needed some Hidonic. Is that your favorite candy? That's my favorite candy. That is and my b- favorite candy. My son oh, is it really? <laughs> literally just brought me this last night. I'm going to have oh it on my Friday. God. Anyway, that sorry. Is, just that no, moment of, there's more stuff I keep just finding out about you that I absolutely love. Keep that's going. funny. No, yeah. no, no. It's, it's hilarious because Reese's Cups, I don't know what they're putting into it, the Hershey company. But man, I mean, my, my record is 27 cups in one sitting. Uh, and that's the full size. Those are the full size. <laughs> God, so, on, man. So, and you are fit. I mean, if I, people I, don't I try see to be. you, uh-huh. you are, I can, you know, you can look at people's necks. I mean, you're shredded, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. I mean, it's part of, part of my journey. I, I'm a little, I'm very much blessed so going to the point that, you know, I fall off the bandwagon, just like everybody else. Sometimes I need food therapy. The, and that's the problem. The challenge here, Eric, food never says no. That's the problem. And so you, what we're trying to do is, is go inside ourselves to be able to say, I'm going to be, I'm going to find that, that motivational impetus inside of me rather than externally in terms of food that I can use to self-medicate myself. So that's one thing. Number two, I'm just blessed because my mother 
took myself and my sister when we were 14 or 15 to the gym, to the ballets, and we signed up as a family. And she was big into this sort of aerobic stuff. She was like the aerobics queen, Jane Fonda. The 70s, 80s. 70s, 80s, you know, yeah. uh, color coordinated, leg warmers, the whole bit. That was I her thing. It. And so she drug us to the gym and was like, you guys figure out something, what you want to do. here?" <laughs> so we're like, okay. And so I just grew up like, oh yeah, you work out. That's what you do. Uh, on your lunch break, you just work out. So I was socialized into that at a very young age. Now your point, which is like, how do you create that later in life? Maybe you're struggling trying to get on the, in on this thing. And that's where the little behaviors and the little pieces of joy, the little nudges uh, can make a big difference. But, you know, I have bad days, I fall off, but it's because it's the journey. It's always the next day is another opportunity to be better than yesterday. I love this. So what are some brand concepts that we can use ourselves to put us on a trajectory to accomplish these goals like physical, yeah, spiritual, love that, uh, emotional, maybe it's a work goal. Like what are some of these brand concepts that maybe we could consider? High performance isn't just reserved for elite athletes and those with unlimited resources. In my free newsletter called Adaptation, I provide you with curated information and resources to improve your health, well-being, and performance. I cover topics like sleep, stress, exercise, nutrition, and mental performance. You can sign up today for this free newsletter at ericcorum.com. That's www.erikkorem.com. Now, back to the show. I love this. Well, well, every single company, every single, well, not every, but the great iconic brands, Eric, understand who they are. And I would suggest everyone should do, you ought to write down, who am I? What is my brand? You know, b- brand with a lowercase b. Uh, what is it I represent? Uh, what is my commitment? What is, what are the things, who, who is it that I want to be? And then write that down, just like a brand has a brand promise. They have somewhere in their internal documentation, they have a statement about this is our mission. This is who we are. This is what we represent. This is our core values. We should be doing that as well. And the reason why you do that, Eric, write that down, right? Because just the the, the research is clear. Just writing it down creates a kind of accountability, it's sort of like it's breathing it into the universe. It's like, okay, there it is on the page. Now it's up to me to align my behaviors to this vision, to this brand that I have of myself. And that's where the work comes in, where it's like, I'm going to now organize my day, my life, my activities, the things that I do around reinforcing this image that I have of an aspirational identity that I want to create. So it's just like a brand. It's like, you need to understand what is my brand, write it down, articulate it, and then look for ways every single day to create opportunities to to manifest that into your life, to reinforce those images, core values, beliefs into your life, and to not be distracted from things that would take you away from that that brand, if you will. So it's 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 a it's it's work, but it's also good work because it is creating a sense of accountability, but it's also creating a purposeful articulation of this concept about who I want to be as well. So if I can re like regurgitate what you just said in my small brain, I need to know who I am and what I stand for. And then by writing that down, actually, I think it's you're 42% more likely to accomplish the goal if you just start writing it down, because then you start strategizing and all the other things. But you write that down, like uh, aim seven, we want to unlock the full human potential. Okay, well, what does it take now to unlock the full human potential? For me, like, you know, I want to be example to my family or I want to, whatever it is. Um, Yep. And then your actions, now you have to start planning out what are the actions that are going to get me there? So like, if I want to um, have a goal, let's just say emotional health, maybe I'm going to get involved in a, like, what are the actions I could take? Uh, gratitude journal. Gratitude journal. Love I'm going to start the morning. Do you do that? I do that every morning and every night. The very first thing I do when I, after I put my shoes on is I, I take an account of what I'm grateful for. Uh, and I just, I think about the people in my life, the things, all of that. And I do that in the morning and at night as part of my, uh, part of my sleep routine, huge. I mean, and and just writing it down reminds you like, 
even if you had a bad day and things went a little bit sideways in your day, Mm -hmm. it's forcing the cognition to, to emphasize that positivity. And it's almost in a way like you're pushing the negative stuff out of your brain. And I'm, I'm, you know, the research, you probably know the research better than I on this, but that creates a kind of different internal physiological response when there's all positive energy all the time Mm -hmm. in your body. I feel like that just really is a very powerful and robust thing. And so things like AIM-7 are critical because now you have the tools. This is what <laughs> this is what blows me away. No, seriously, because before it's sort of like you're doing all this kind of hit and miss. It's all in your head. It's all self-perceived. Now you've actually got the tools to track the, the markers that uh-huh. tell you, okay, I'm on, I'm on this right trajectory and I'm, and, and I'm optimizing in a way to be able to thrive in my individual life. Well, you, you opened the can. Um, <laughs> I know that you like yes, wearable technology. I do. I, do. Um, I think we're both right now wearing an aura ring. Yes. <laughs> um, where did, where did that start for you? Your, your love for yeah. technology and health. Now, I love that. It's, it, it's an interface. First of all, I'm a digital immigrant, so I'm struggling okay. <laughs> because it's like, people are like, you know, NFTs and crypto and all that, oh, you know, web, yeah. web metaverse 3.0. So I got to figure that out. Where uh, you still, are, especially, is probably yes. getting thrown around a lot. Thrown around a lot. So yeah. I'm struggling to keep up with the tech. So I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm forcing myself to be as tech savvy as I can possibly possibly be as a digital immigrant. The other thing is, Eric, it, is it, there's a fundamental premise. So I'm a social scientist. Right. And there's a fundamental premise that says, basically, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Mm. So you, you need, you need clear objective measurement of stuff to be able to understand how can I affect this stuff? How can I create a Delta, a change around this stuff? So it all, so for me, it all starts with that premise. And so in the precision of scientific and empirical analysis, that's where data opens up all kinds of opportunities. And I guess I'm just a kind of a little bit of a data geek because I just find that super interesting when you can, you know, I was one of the first to like put on a heart rate monitor and like, okay, what's this heart rate thing? How, how can I use it to, to squeeze a little bit of more, uh, you know, capacity out what I'm out of what I'm trying to do. And so the data then opens up, does two things. Number one, it makes you aware of what you should be tracking, but number two, it allows you to self-experiment where you can sort of figure out what are some changes that I can do in my behavior that can impact these markers that will help me understand how to get a more optimized trajectory of self-empowerment, self-awareness, self-improvement, and personal growth, like you were saying. So what are your favorite metrics to track? Yeah. Well, I love, so, you know, I'm I'm big into heart rate variability, uh, HRV. I've been tracking a lot. Um, uh, and it's, I, you know, I immediately the wearable world sort of turned me on to this metric and understanding, you know, how I can, uh, control the autonomic nervous system aspects, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic to be able to, to be ready, maximally ready. So HRV is one I, I pay a, a lot of attention to, uh, resting heart rate of my heart. When I do my workouts, Eric, now I'm trying to find that sort of threshold where I can, where I can output at my maximum without sort of hitting the diminishing marginal utility point. So in my mind, every single workout is an S curve. And at the inflection point is my effort to recovery ratio, where I try to hit that point every single workout where, okay, that last set was the set that now has me incrementally improving at uh, a, a rate that's slowing down. So it's time to stop the workout. And so you know we have a feature for that, right? I love this, man. I'm telling you, I'm all over AIM-7. Uh, and that, this is data, data, man. Data unlocks yeah. everything. Like, right? This is, this yes. is how we, we can really unleash the full potential. So are there, habit, are, there, are there behaviors in your life that you've realized impacted your HRV in a negative yeah. or a positive way? Yeah. So almost immediately, uh, Eric, it's funny, you know, alcohol, which I enjoy, or I used to enjoy, I enjoyed it a lot more. It's interesting because alcohol is, you know, kind of liquid courage, right? So and it's right. a very, for me, of like a communal thing, like go socially drink with people. Mm-hmm. But what I, what it's very clear that alcohol, and this is the other premise 
which is part of my approach, Eric, which is to say, there's no such thing as a neutral behavior. Every single behavior is either positive or negative with respect to your ability to show up at full capacity and optimize. And it just turns out the research is clear that alcohol is a negative uh, component. Now, is this America's on a high horse saying, don't drink? No, not at all. What I'm saying is that when you drink alcohol, especially later in the day, it's very clear that it has negative impacts on your HRV, lowers your HRV. Uh, and you want your HRV to be higher, uh, and so on. And so for me, that my process, Eric, was that it, now I'm in return on investment decision making calculus. Like, is mm -hmm. this worth it for me to, especially at my age because I'm 51? Is this worth it? You look great. Dead, oh, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I try. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm fighting Father Time as long as I can. Uh, but unfortunately, Father Time and Mother Nature always win. So we'll see how this goes. Turns out. But anyway, so uh, so so but but that that, you know, and so for me, it's like, OK, well, at 51, the ROI on alcohol is not the same as when I was 20 and 30 and maybe even 40. So it's just not worth it. It's it, it just takes me back. So, you know, so that was something that I cut out, for example, uh, just based on very clear data patterns uh, from my wearable. Uh, that is like. The number one thing I hear from people when I ask about their wearable, they're like, I found out that alcohol was messing up my sleep and I wasn't recovering as well. Yeah, I have almost completely cut it out. And I don't know if it's never really matched well with my body. I like yeah. swell. It's very weird. <laughs> I don't know about you, yeah. but I found that I can't eat later in the evening. Like yep. I, my last meal needs to be around five thirty to six yep. at the latest. Yep. Because it jacks up my HRV. Because if you think about it, when you when you sleep, you want to get more into a parasympathetic state, rest and digest. Yep. Um, now my body's, well, blood is shunted to your gut in a parasympathetic state, but now it's having to mobilize resources to digest a large meal. Right. And so if I give exactly. myself three to four hours, I sleep better. My HRV is better. My resting heart rate is lower. Yes. That's been one of the things in the past six months that I've, I've yes. changed um, yes. because it just, it messes me up. Interesting. Yeah. hundred percent. And you touched on something that, that is, uh, you know, we're, you and I are cut from the same cloth, obviously, <laughs> man. You know, you're, you're, you're basically a brother from another mother. I was just uh, thinking the same thing. <laughs> I love this. This is so much fun. Yeah, I mean, I huge. Like, it, I'm big right now into intermittent fasting. I mean, I love it. You know, I, the the idea of a feeding window is something that is incredibly powerful for me. Mm -hmm. And I instantiated that probably two years ago. And like right off the bat, I lost like 15 pounds. Like right off the bat, just you know, ceteris paribus, everything else being equal, just shrinking the the feeding window to a certain time, and usually it's between uh, 12 to four. Uh, 4 30 uh, to your point about not wanting to eat too late and then and and so and and then here's what happened which was really an aha moment for me eric which is to say i used to conceptualize food as a discrete event right breakfast lunch dinner snacking etc when i started to go to intermittent fasting it's like here's the feeding window it's 12 to 4 so it, it's everything's going to happen in, in this feeding window but it's like food became something different. It, it wasn't like, okay, when am I going to get this next thing inside of my, you know, it, 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 it released the emotional urgency huh. around food. And it opened, it helped me like rethink and redefine, recharacterize, reimagine food in a completely different way. Here's my feeding window. I'm going to get all my calories during this window and then I'm done. And then I don't have to worry about food anymore. And so that was something that was like an aha moment for me, but it was driven by the fact that your point, which is to say that I was looking at the my intermittent fasting uh, interventions on my HRV and just massive effect in terms of improvement, higher HRV when I'm doing this feeding window, uh, intermittent fasting kind of a thing. So, you know, and I know with with, with a lot of people, food is a challenge. Right. Yes. Because again, food is therapy. Food makes you feel food never says no. Food is always going to make you mm -hmm. happy, especially sugar and fats and cream, all this stuff that, you know, our brains are hardwired to say, man, that's really good. And so like reimagining that and re and, and looking at food more as functional for me is uh -huh. has been something that that really helps. So it's like, 
you know, I don't think of it now, of course, you know, I'll, I'll give into the Reese's cups or there'll be a day where I just like, you know the what? 28 I'm, Reese's cups. And it's, yeah. I gotta be my record, man. I'm telling you if there was an, if there was a Reese's cup eating competition, you know, kind of like the hot, that's sort of the, uh, the Nathan's yes. hot dog, uh, sort of championships. I would enter that. And I think I could compete pretty good, but anyway, uh, you know, back to the regularly scheduled programming here. So, so, so I fall off all the time, but then I give myself the, the leeway, Eric, where it's like, yeah, I'm going to have that, you know, bacon and fat and all this good stuff yeah. that I, I like and all this pasta. I'm going to have that. But what I'm finding is that the more I tune in to the optimization, the less, the less, uh, the less happy junk food. It's not makes. as enjoyable. It's not. It's just not. And I don't, don't like, want to be a buzzkill for people, yeah. but it's like when your body is clicking and feeling a certain way. You just kind of don't want to deviate from the pattern because yes. you're more present, you're working better, you're in a better mood. Uh, your body's just doing the things that it was designed to do. Exactly. And exactly. Look, I don't, I don't want to vilify like our anniversary was recently and we're going to go out and have a good dinner later this week. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And so. My wife is like, when do you want to go to dinner? I'm like, can we make it earlier? Because I just know, like, we're going to eat. She wants Italian, so we're going to eat some pasta or whatever. Ooh, nice. And I just want to be able to sleep good that night. I don't want to yes. wake up and just feel like garbage. Um, something I've been looking into recently is uh, not just intermittent fasting, which I do, but uh, intermittent, like, calorie windows. So, mm, like, times of the week. There was an interesting paper that oh, came out that showed – that if uh, people that usually almost 100% of the time, if you want to lose weight and you go on a calorie uh, deficit, you're going to lose muscle. Okay. This paper showed that if you, for five days a week, people ate at 35% below maintenance. Okay. They, and they eat significantly more. They had a higher level 1.8 grams per kilogram for protein, Got but it. they did resistance training four times a week. That's a key Got thing it. here. Gotcha. Then two days of the week. So let's say Monday through Friday, they ate negative 35%. Then Saturday, Sunday, they ate at maintenance. Gotcha. And significantly increased their carbohydrate intake. Got but it. But after seven weeks, they lost even more weight than their counterparts and maintained muscle. Interesting. So Interesting. I think there's this, you know, having windows of and this is for weight loss. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that would like to lose weight. That's kind of like the thing, right? Yeah. But there's massive companies around this. Um, but uh, this idea of caloric restriction, mm -hmm. caloric, you know, intermittent feeding. And yeah. if you think about it, like several hundred years ago, I mean, like even a several hundred years ago, people weren't able to have access to food like we have access. Being fed all the time <laughs> is not a great thing. Yes. Like yeah. we should feel what it feels like to be hungry. Yes. On a lot of different levels. Yes. Um, it will help you empathize more with people around the world that don't have access to food. Excellent point. Right. If you, if it, it's also a great spiritual discipline. Yes. And it's also like phenomenal for your body. The literature is so overwhelming right now for autophagy, blood sugar regulation, all these things. So mm -hmm. I'm just, um, mm -hmm. just backing up everything that you're saying that, um, I think these are wonderful practices. Yeah. So what, like, what is like, what is your journey morphing to as you age now, <laughs> your wellness journey? Cause I'm over yeah. 40 now and my thought processes are changing now that you've hit 50 and you look phenomenal you have ton, you. you know the world is changing as far as age is concerned but like yes. what are your like what are you pressing towards yeah it's very interesting I've, I've been through almost all of the the requisite phases of, of fitness at one point okay. i was in i was you know really attracted to the bodybuilding lifestyle uh i never did bodybuilding but i was just fascinated by the discipline that it takes Mm. to to diet and and have a routine uh that you're committing 24 7 of your life you're you're basically sacrificing your relationships everything gets sacrificed for that plastic trophy to stand on a stage and get oiled up in a bikini uh so it's next level it's next level man it's totally next level so i was fascinated by that 
now here I'm, I'm more into like functional fitness, Eric. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing myself, okay, when I'm 60, 65, 70, I want to be able to take my carry on and put it on the plane myself. I want to be able to like walk mm -hmm. around and be mobile and travel and to have all of the, you know, all of that robustness around my fitness that's more functional. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my journey is going. Uh, it's great to be ripped and I love being, you know, diced to the socks, as they say. <laughs> but I, I realize also as well that I can't maintain that forever. Uh -huh. uh, you know, certainly not naturally. Uh, but it's something that I think about in terms of I have to reimagine my journey mm -hmm. and re and, and re reset the expectations of what exactly it is that I'm going to look like uh, as I age uh, and not be upset with it and be you know, sort of comfortable in my own skin. So I've already kind of mapped out that trajectory and mm -hmm. what that's going to look like. Uh, and, and to be, and here's where it's interesting, right? Because we were talking earlier on, Eric, about the notion of creating an identity around health and fitness. That yes. identity has to be malleable. It has to be flexible. And what that means is this is what you see with professional athletes all the time. Uh, there's a quote that's has been attributed to to Steve Nash, the basketball player. Uh, I've heard I've heard this attributed. Love to that him. guy. I love this guy. Two time MVP. Uh, you know, they some some people slept on him, but he was a fantastic player. But later on in his career, uh, he was he started having back lower back problems. You know, back spasms, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But he said, or he, it was attributed to him saying that the athlete dies twice. And, and what he meant by that was if, if your identity is solely invested in this thing, then when you can't, as your skills begin to fade, it's much harder because so much of who you are is wrapped up in that. Mm -hmm. So as people who are going on a fitness and wellness journey, we have to understand that we can't let our identity be too, uh, too tied to like, okay, I look a certain way. You know, it has to be tied to the process of wellness and fitness and spiritual, emotional and physical robustness over time with the malleability, Eric, to be able to say that, listen, I'm not going to look like I look like when I was 20, when I'm 30 and when I was 30, when I'm 40, it's things are going to change. And that's OK, because my mentality is not changing and my identity is more tied to my mentality than it is to the actual physical manifestation of what I'm creating as an outward uh, result of doing all of these fitness related activities, if that makes sense. That makes total sense. And I think that's a great way to wrap this up, because and I think I want to put a bow on this in a way that encourages people. If I were to, once again, I think it's important to like recap in my own mind, there's a lot to be understood about like why people choose certain brands. Yes. It's because they want to identify with something. If you want to identify and if you want to create the environment for the pursuit of health and wellness in all different facets, you need to identify who you are. You need yep. to have like your own personal mission statement. And then you yes. know, need to start thinking about the actions that are going to be required to get you there and find joy That's right. in the process. And then understand that this is going to change over time. That's right. This is not a like, like, okay, I did it. I'm done. Yep. It's like at every step of life, you're going to be changing. And I think this is just a beautiful way of, of putting all this together. Um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes for your TED Talk. What are other ways people can find you, follow you, learn yeah. more about what you're doing? Well, thanks a lot, Eric. I really appreciate the opportunity. Love AIM7. Uh, love the podcast. Keep doing the, the great work that you're doing. Uh, if your listeners are interested in uh, linking up with me, uh, probably the easiest way is uh, I'm on a couple of social media platforms. I'm, I'm on Twitter uh, at A-M-R-E-E-D-2. Uh, and I'm also on Instagram uh, at Professor Americas, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-A-M-E-R-I-C-U-S, one word, uh, on the on the gram, as the kids say. I love it. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok yet because I got to figure that out. I got I don't know what, what I'm going to say on TikTok yet. So <laughs> I'm working all that. But, you know, you can follow me there, Twitter, Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn if, if your listeners want to connect on more business related kinds of things as well. Mm -hmm. So like I said, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with a like minded professional and guru 
that's like really digging in on, in this space. And it's been a wonderful conversation. In my view. Thank you. If this episode made an impact in your life, please share it with someone else who could use this positive message. We are a community looking to make an impact. And this is one of the best ways you can help us spread the message of the blueprint. Thanks for joining us today. And I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.